This is a conversation with Cole Gordon, founder of Closer.io and one of the world's leading experts on remote high ticket sales. He's personally sold more than $10 million worth of online coaching, consulting and agency services over the phone. We talked about scaling sales teams and the art of a sale along with how he kickstarted his career and became so successful. If you want to know how to scale your sales team to make 10 times more per month, then you should listen to this podcast. See you inside. What service do you exactly offer at Closers.io? Gotcha. Well, uh, first of all, we have a sales training and recruiting company. So Closers.io is a whole co. There's two, well, there's three companies under that. One of them is a certification company that is basically taking people who are either in sales in different industries or maybe they're just looking to get into sales and getting them into remote online high ticket sales, right? So, um, you know, just to be candid, like we work with anybody who uh, sells stuff that's over $3,000 with a remote sales team. So it's not just like people in the coaching space per se, but um, that's what our main company is, is, is training and certifying people to get into those industries. And some of the people that come in are really experienced sales people. They just want to learn the online industry, so to speak, or the coaching industry, so to speak, a little bit better. Um, then we have Sales Team Accelerator, which is essentially a company that helps recruit, hire, train, place, manage salespeople and build sales teams. And we do that for, again, really any business that has a remote sales team, sells something that's over the phone, three, four grand, if not more, right? So that could be SaaS companies, coaching companies, consulting companies, agencies, done for you online services, uh, et cetera, medical device, even we have some people. So um, that company helps them obviously place sales people, build sales teams, grow their business. And then on top of that, we do just help with really everything, lead gen, marketing and sales. And even in our mastermind, which is uh, the ascension from that eight figure boardroom, we help with everything, really sharing all the practices that got us to 40 million a year. Pace at least is where we're at this uh, this year so far is uh, we share that in the mastermind, just kind of distilling all the best practices and also bringing great people together. And then our third company that's under closers.io is a uh, company that essentially is a partnership company. So this is almost like another whole co under the whole co, but this company has anywhere from 30 to 50% interest and about uh, six, might be plus or minus one, uh, but six companies, right? And that ranges from stem cells, publishing, uh, real estate coaching, and a few other verticals. And so that's our kind of new 2023 thing that we've been doing this year. It's been going great. And it's been awesome to have other partners on and and uh, just being able to diversify out besides our two really core things. Okay, cool. Thank you. So did I understand that right? So you're basically offering to instead of like a consultancy model or a uh, model in which you help people make sales, you actually like instead of invoicing them, you essentially take uh, some equity in their company. And so then uh, you help them scale up. Yeah, correct. Interesting. How, how did you get to start that model? Well, I mean, people have been asking us since the beginning of time to not the beginning of time, but you know, ever since we started the company to do stuff like done for you, right? Like, Oh, I wish mm -hmm. you could just do this for me. And then on top of that, there's always like three to five people or deals that come along, uh, each year that are genuinely like, man, if we just ran the sales team and partnered with them 50, 50, like this would be a, you know, 30, 50, a hundred million dollar a year opportunity, sometimes even like, man, multiple nine figure exit type opportunity. But you know, it's just a better opportunity vehicle. Uh, it's not necessarily what we do, but man, if we just did the marketing and sales, we could really scale it. The problem was, is that you have to look at opportunity costs. So for a long, long time, you know, any excess energy we had just made sense to put back into scaling our current companies, right? And keeping yeah. our, um, you know, B2C and our B2B company, just keeping to grow those. But, you know, as those get bigger, there's 
not only more energy it takes to continue to scale it, there's also more energy it takes just to maintain the level than what you're at. And there's increasing amount of diminishing returns, at least at the current model, right? There's ways around that, but at least at the current model. So how do you get around that? What do we do differently? Well, doing that was a way in which we feel it's, it's a much slower start. It's not as profitable in the beginning. However, longer term with these, uh, contracts are all in perpetuity. They all, um, are, you know, they're not like a year, three year contracts, right? I mean, it's, it's a true partnership. Um, this model really is the only model that we have that truly, truly, truly compounds, right? To where, you know, if mm. we have five partners in year one and then we bring on another five partners in year two, hopefully we'll have 10 partners, right? You never know something could happen with somebody and maybe somebody decides to shut down their business or something or you, you sell a partner. But, you know, in general, mm. you're going to have compounding in the addition of the amount of partners you're bringing on, but also in the revenues, right? So it's something that obviously, you know, we've been thinking about doing something like this for a while. Then, you know, when you watch somebody like Alex Robosium, what he's doing, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, we didn't find that his model with like taking minority interests uh, made sense for us at least. And so, you know, what we prefer to do is, is take, uh, you know, half essentially mm-hmm. and uh, scale up the folks, you know, and, um, it just, I, we found the speed of growth in doing that was far, far superior than just taking a minority and really betting on the founder. Not that we don't try to pick great founders and great partners. Obviously that's a huge criteria, but, uh, we would rather have less people, bigger interests, more skin in the game. Interesting. So, um, what's, what's the difference between like for, from, from your guys's perspective, what's the difference between the majority um, share and 50, 50, like what, what's the situ, what's the difference in the situation of these business owners in your opinion? Like what makes the difference? Okay. It's, it's, it's more share, but what's the difference? Right, 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 right. So you, you said, what's the difference between majority share and 50, 50? Define Uh, between, 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 okay. Majority. I'm sorry. Uh, between 50 50 your model and for example what hermosi uh said with mon- minority yeah well i mean that's like more of the the war buffett model right where you're kind of picking great people getting out of the way and being a resource for them and supporting them mm-hmm. and um obviously the biggest difference is if you have a minority um there's less operational complexity you're able to take on more partners you're more betting on that partner. So it's much, much more decentralized. And so ultimately, like I think done correctly, that actually has a bigger scale potential. Um, I think the challenges with that model is that you really got to find truly, truly, truly outstanding founders. And those founders also want to have to give you interest in your company. And I think that's why it works really, really well for him is because obviously deal flow wise, you know, he's probably got hundred X more deal flow than I do. And then at the same time, you know, I would say he's more experienced. He's a really, really brilliant guy. And just through knowledge, he can get equity without, you know, a lot of operational complexity. Mm-hmm. And then this is, you know, hearsay. Like, I, I don't know exactly how his model works. So if I'm butchering it, then, you know, I apologize. But with the, with what we do, it's just, uh, it's, it's a little bit more like, Hey, we're going to come in. There's, there's four key parts of your business, marketing, sales, ops, fulfillment. Right. I'm massively simplifying that, but let's just say it's four key parts, marketing, sales, off fulfillment. We're going to take over half of those, you know? And so the downside for us is that, you know, yeah, we have a little bit more eggs in one basket. There's more operational complexity as you scale, but the upside is, is you get a lot more control, right? So when you invest in a company, one of the things you'll find is like, it's like sometimes it's just, uh, like we, we, we took a minority and a few people before we decided to, pivot the model. And we just found that the founders just weren't quite there. You know, it's like there was a lot of personal and professional development and skill set development that they would need to go to over the course of years to be able to really like perform the way we needed them to perform. And then on top of that, um, you know, it's like we found that because they didn't have those skills, we felt like we were probably putting in equal time to just doing it ourselves. Right. And so with a higher percentage doing it ourselves, we could just come in and then it's like explode, you know? So some of the companies we worked with in 90 days have went from 50 K a month to 
500K a month, right? Wow. Uh, from 80K a month to 400 grand a month. And then we have some that, you know, uh, where we were like, there's one, for instance, where we're adding a, a, a product onto their back end, essentially. It's kind of hard to explain without disclosing um, too much detail, but, you know, we're basically adding on a back end product to an existing really front end profitable business. And that one, 100K a month in 14 days, right? So that type of explosiveness, you know, you can only get when you come in as a value add and you can control what you're best at. I see. Yeah, absolutely. So what, yeah, what's interesting for me in those deals is always how do you decide whether you want equity in one company? How do you, how do you assess that? Well, I mean, the first thing is, is when we're looking at deals, um, we want to look at several things. And I have this actually all written out and I'm probably going to not say it correctly off the top of my head. But um, the first thing is, is we like to have a pre-existing relationship with the founder, right? I, I don't like, we've had deals and I've, I've been connected with people that you would probably know who are like Twitter, YouTube famous and shit. And, you know, we've had people connect us, but they didn't know who we were, right? And so because of that, it's like having this conversation of trying to like win the trust over somebody, especially when you're talking that high equity amounts, it's pretty tough, right? So inbound, mm -hmm. I think is very, very key. And the way we've created the inbound is just by basically using our front end B2B is obviously a profitable business in and within itself, but also as an incubator for deal flow. Right. To really have people come in. Okay. They could see our expertise, see how we operate, see like, okay, these guys are the real deal for sure. And they're really, really good at what they do. They're doing it at the highest level out there. They have tons and tons of high level clients. They come in with that frame. And then what we'll do is we'll get a lot of applicants from people within the, within the program and the incubator. And then from that, we're just going to select, you know, the top one or two. Right. So that's one of the biggest criteria. Another criteria is obviously the founder has got to be legit, right? So they have to have similar, uh, you know, we have to like, we have to figure out what their values and their mission or sorry, their mission and their vision is. And we have to see if we align with that, right? Because we're really coming in under, um, you know, their brand, right? In, in the equity portfolios. Yeah. So we want to make sure we align in that way. We also want to make sure the values are very, very similar, right? So like, is this somebody that could work with us on, like if, if they were on our team, and they were working with us or we were working with them, like, would we enjoy working with them? Are they cool? Are they fun? Mm -hmm. Like, are they competent? Are they a high performer? Like, do we, do we work well together? Right? So that's, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is, um, you know, just it's overall like, um, is, is, is this founder truly somebody who's outstanding? Then after that, what we look for is really what the opportunity is, right? And so for us, like our base case is we can very, very quickly ramp a team of six salespeople, right? Mm -hmm. Six salespeople is like this one number, six to eight generally, but like six to eight, you only need really one manager. And so it's like, if we come in and just get a team of 60, six to eight fully ramped, what is the delta between where they are now and where that place would be? Because that's just the easiest upside for us. Right. So like, let's say somebody's at, you know, like for instance, there was a company that, that we would normally never start with a company this small, but they were, they were 50 K a month, but they were in, um, the medical space. And so they're selling a certain product that has to go through years of FDA regulation. And there's a lot of moats around entry in the competition and it just works perfectly with our model. So we made a lot, we made an exception. And we're doing the math. It's like, okay, they're doing 50 K a month. Now, if we had a team of six all ramped, you know, we would be doing 1.5 million a month, right? Well, if we can take mm -hmm. all the upside of that 1.5 million a month, I mean, that, that's a, that's a huge base case for us. Whereas if somebody, let's say is doing a million a month already and they have six salespeople, and if maybe those six salespeople were all better ramped and we could add two and get it to eight, it's only 1.5 million a month and it's a lot more profitable. Sure. That's decent upside for us, but it's, it's, it's not that great of return unless the founder just wants to give us a huge existing piece of the pie of what they've already built, which is, is obviously a little bit more difficult. We like to be a little bit more upside uh, oriented. So we kind of look at that as well. 
Um, a big other part of what we look at is their marketing. Like in general, uh, I'm a great marketer. Like I believe I could probably write lead gen copy for almost any business. However, mm-hmm. like if I can avoid having to do that and I can walk into a business with current controls and then maybe just improve the performance of those controls through a few funnel tweaks and through a little bit better media buying, then I would rather do that than have to spend, you know, three weeks, uh, with my, my team and myself producing a VSL from scratch, right? Or producing uh, a webinar or some sort of client acquisition system from scratch and then going through the process of validating that, right? So I like to have that client acquisition validated as well. So you look at the founder, you look at the client acquisition, you look at uh, kind of that base case of what increase you can get from the sales team. I'd say another thing that we look at is um, is the just the the TAM, like how big the opportunity is, right? Uh, we're not necessarily only looking for exits, but like, is this something where we can scale and hit a huge multiple? Is this something in which, um, you know, two, three million a month is like, you know, totally doable, right? Uh, part of that intertwined with that is how like me too is this offer slash product slash business versus unique, right? So, um, a great example again is like, that one company that had to go through all those FDA regulations, well, that's a great company for us to partner with because there's no, there was, for the way we were going to market at least, there was no competition, hmm. right? And in fact, if somebody saw our ads and wanted to copy it, they have to go through a couple year approval process to actually be able to advertise that product because of the regulations associated with it, right? So there's this huge mode around the competition. It's a huge TAM and, um, it's just, it's just something that's very different. Whereas if somebody has, you know, an offer that's coaches teaching coaches how to be coaches and there's nothing different about it, I don't care how cool they are. Or like what, you know, it's just, it's, it's like, you know, there's just no point in, in putting our resources towards something we don't feel like is unique and has an edge, right? Another edge could be, um, they have a huge distribution. So for instance, we partner with people. Uh, solely, like not solely, but one of the big factors is on top of them having great mission, vision, and values, us aligning with them, they're a cool person, we see the opportunity, is they might have a huge social audience, right? Or a massive Facebook group, or just some asset that really also provides a unique advantage, right? So that's something we look at as well. Um, I might be forgetting one or two things, but those are just generally the things that we, we look at and, um, we just try to find deals. Like the overall kind of feeling is that, you know, there've been so many times throughout the course of my career where I get on a call or I'd be talking with a founder and I'd be like, you know, I'd be helping them with their sales team or whatever. And I just think to myself like, man, like if I had your business, I would do 5 million a month. You know, I, I would just be like, in, you know, the growth would be insane. I, I want that feeling, you know, of like, holy shit, like you have this opportunity vehicle, whether that's because a lot of times of the built in distribution or because of like it's a blue ocean opportunity with a huge town. I see. That's very interesting. I also invested in uh, smaller companies. One of the challenges, yeah, for me, one of the biggest challenges was to really assess the character of the founder. I have had occasions where uh, the founder so far has worked well and then me coming in, of course, in my case was with money. It wasn't with marketing and sales and all of a sudden he did nothing anymore and i didn't i I couldn't see that coming like before that uh, he was working a lot and then it just stopped um how do you i i think it's 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 very it's very crucial to kind of kind of be able to read people have you had did you ever make mistakes with vetting a founder yeah, I mean, we've, we've made a tremendous amount of stake, mistakes, and I don't even think it's anything that we couldn't have identified in the very beginning as much as it is we just got a little bit overly eager. And, you know, closers.io, we, we, we over here tend to be, um, you know, we're, we're salespeople, right? Like we like to sell. Uh, doesn't mean we don't have a great product. Doesn't mean we don't focus on client results. Doesn't mean we don't, you know, do all of those things that are all so equally as important, but, you know, we over here, you know, me and, and some of my partners, we like closing the deal, you know, it's kind of fun. And so a lot of it was just a little bit overly eager to get a deal when in reality we should have been patient. It wasn't the best deal. That's really what the thing was of that. 
Uh, we didn't have anybody who like stopped working, uh, per se, but you know, just people who they just weren't the caliber of founder we would like to have worked with. And, you know, you, you take those lessons and there's no shame in making the mistake. There's only shame in not learning from the mistake. And, um, uh, and repeating the same mistake, right? So as long as you can learn the lesson and move forward, I mean, we've adjusted and that's where we are at now. And you know, we have a much, much better model now. So that's one aspect of things. I mean, the other aspect too is, you know, we'll come in with money, but um, the way we do it, we don't necessarily like invest into the company. Uh, like most of these companies are not exitable, right? At least when, when we're coming in, you know, nobody would buy it. Nobody would even look at it. Right. So there's no valuation in which we're, we're, we're taking a, uh, you know, like a piece of that valuation in which it's trading at, right? Like it's not worth anything. Um, doesn't mean it's not a good company. It's just usually too founder centric and there's just, it's just not built to sell Mm -hmm. yet. Right. But what we will do is, um, a big barrier to scale with a lot of people is the fear of really investing into the company from an advertising standpoint. And so, you know, whereas when with me, you know, if I'm launching a new campaign or a new offer, a new business, like I'm, I'm cool with coming into the market, spending a hundred K a month on ads, you know, like that's Mm -hmm. or like 50 K a month on ads. Maybe if, if, if it can't bear a hundred K a month, but I'd spend up to a hundred K a month for first month, just as an investment. Right. And uh, that's a unique position I'm in because my other businesses cash flow so well that, you know, a lot of people aren't going to be in that position. They're going to, really go slow and try to stair step it up. So one of the things we do offer um, some of our partners is the ability if needed to where I can just finance all the advertising. Obviously I'm gonna get a preferential returning, make sure I get paid every dollar I put in back first, right? But that does cover any potential losses, right? And kind of acts for them as like a stopgap, so to speak. I see. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very interesting model. How do you how do you sell that? Let's say I'm a potential customer. I approach you. I say, hey, I have a, like a five thousand dollar product. I'm doing a, I don't know a consultancy or something something like that. And you you think, oh, that that would be an interesting partner for me. How do you yeah? Sell so I mean, like becoming a partner. For us, um, to be honest, it's, it's not as much like, again, what I found is if we have to sell you, uh, it's probably not a good deal, right? Like we like the folks to come in with like knowing that, you know, man, if I work with the, like the question really shouldn't be, can these guys do what they say? The question should be like, I know what these guys can do what they say because I've had experience with them up until this point. The question at this point is only like, how much are they going to ask? And am I comfortable with that? And is what they're going to bring to the table worth what I'm going to ask, right? So it's not as much a selling process as, a, as it is like a qualifying process, which I know is cliche to say, but it's true. Um, you know, and, and again, the key to that is like, it does take some authority building to be able to get there. Now, that all being said, what I like to do is I like to number one, look at all. So, so usually we'll get on and just high level float out the idea. Then after that, what we do is a discovery. So we'll look at all their assets, all their resources amongst almost every single department and we'll map out the entire business. And through this, we want to look at a couple of things, right? Number one, we want to look at, um, all of their really kind of growth and value chain metrics. And, and, and identify what the constraints are. So in other words, if you're familiar with the theory of constraints, like what is the one, like what is the constraint right now that if alleviated would increase throughput through the entire business, right? So it's an art to really figure out, okay, what is the true constraint? And then once that's alleviated, what's going to be the next constraint, right? So that's the number one thing that we always want to figure out. The number two thing is we just qualitatively look at, uh, you know, Like, let's say sales meetings, sales calls, fulfillment meetings, fulfillment calls, uh, the structure and the org chart, um, you know, all their SOPs and probably like just a lot, a lot of the different stuff. It is pretty extensive. And we just identify all of, you know, here's where we think we could get it. Here's like the standard of what we think an excellent eight figure company would operate like and what it would look like. Here's where they are. 
And mm -hmm. that eventually across the, you know, a couple year plan is something we're going to address and help build into that company. And so usually by the time we get done through all of that, uh, there's obvious gaps, right? Because we're not going to enter in discovery with somebody that we don't feel like we can massively add value to. And so there's a lot of gaps. And then we kind of just outline um, the plan in phases. And each phase correlates with a certain constraint, so to speak, right? So phase one might be fixing, you know, a few bottlenecks or kind of leaky holes within the business so we can increase LTV and increase retention. Then once the vehicle is better, then we'll ramp up marketing and sales. And then, you know, so it just... It just really depends on what it is, um, but that's the general process of things. And, and usually the idea is, and this is with any sale, is that you develop a thesis and the first agreement needs to come on the thesis, right? So like, mm -hmm. what is the concept of what we're doing? What is the idea around what we're doing? We need them to get to the agree to the idea. So in this case, if I construct five phases of a plan to get a company from 100K a month to a million a month, if I construct five phases, then essentially what needs to happen is I need to get them to agree that those five phases, independent of working with us or not, is what they need to do to be able to get to the next level, which is something um, that, you know, like even presenting those five phases in and within itself should actually be valuable. So we're actually providing value within that process as well. Um, and then once we get the agreement, they're like, yeah, independent, like I, this is totally what we need to do. Totally agree. Then we can just work on terms, right? Because if they agree with really the method and the path, then it's just a matter of, okay, they're obviously going to agree with working with us as a byproduct. Um, it's just a matter of nailing down the terms. And then that's the kind of the separate part of the conversation. But I, the idea is, is really through obviously everything that's happened before this process with you know, coming in, knowing who we are, there's, you know, obviously authority built and like, they know we can do what we say, et cetera. And then through those five phases, by the time we get to the terms, the value has been built pretty damn high. And we also want to make it something to where, you know, most deals we're investing in, like it's, we're not, you know, I'm not as interested or I don't even feel as good about taking something existing that they have, like taking a piece of their current pie I would like to just take a piece of the pie that we're going to build, you know, and, and, and a mm -hmm. part of the upside. Sometimes we have to take interest of the uh, current revenue. And that's simply just because, um, you know, we need to pay our staff, right? So like we need to kind of not go in a loss at the beginning, but that's basically it. I see. That's a cool, that's a cool business model. How do you, uh, do you have a long-term goal there? Do you have a vision? Like, where do you want to be with that thing in 10 years or so? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, 10 years, it's hard to say so much stuff is going to change. And, you know, what we're most focused on is just being an adaptable company that despite the conditions and the environment can adapt and, and uh, you know, roll with the punches as time goes. But yeah, over the long term, I mean, what we want to do is obviously have these partners, have them in perpetuity. It's long term contracts and then have several at once and have that growth compounding and then also learn. Um, I'd like to, you know, um, not be necessarily exclusive to the coaching, consulting kind of e-learning space. Right. I'd like to, you know, one of the areas we're looking into heavily is um, how would you define it? It's like the medical space, whether that's medical device, um, uh, not necessarily biohacking, right? Is not the right term, but mm -hmm. um, medical device, um, just higher ticket health items, essentially. So uh, stuff like that, that the model works with. It's just not very like the standard in that industry is not selling and um marketing the way that our company knows how to market, right? A lot of it is, you know, affiliates or word of mouth referral or SEO or a lot of organic social media and influencers. But in terms of the way we do it, um, you know, it's kind of like a blue ocean. So that's a space we're kind of looking into as well. And we'd like to find some, uh, well, we really have a great partner there. We're just in a series of launching off some brands. But other than that, I mean, you know, we'd like to see it um, eventually be, you know, five to 10 million a month in uh, EBITDA. Nice. Um, you mentioned that you, you're doing sales and marketing and 
I think a lot of companies have the problem that they're not really synced with sales and marketing. Um, how do you, how would you sync sales and marketing in your opinion? How does that work? How to keep it in sync? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously it comes down to, um, there's, there's several things. I mean, there's definitions, there's communication. So, uh, the first things first is like, you really need to have all of the tracking across like it almost like if you look at like growth metrics, it's like 50% of those metrics are marketing and 50% are sales. And they kind of linearly go from point A to point B all the way down to enrolled client. Right. And so kind of in this stage where there's like metrics sort of in the middle here near the handoff period, you need those clearly defined so that everybody has a clear agreement on what a marketing qualified lead is, a sales qualified lead, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That way from a data driven standpoint, if quality goes down, we have a metric that, you know, we could really point to and say, yes, quality has gone down. If volume goes down, we have a metric to point to. If close rate or sales performance or whatever goes down, we have a metric to point to, right? So that's the first thing first. The second thing is really having good communication and keeping teams in sync. So, you know, for us, we have five marketing meetings a week, but two of those meetings is called the sales and marketing sync where we get on and review, guess what? All of those metrics and we talk about it, right? Now, um, one of the things that I think has really helped our company is that I was a salesperson. I managed the sales team. Then I obviously, you know, hired a sales manager and then now I have, you know, a sell, you know, a sales director, then sales manager, et cetera. But I, you know, I've, I've delegated all that function. And then for a long time, I was really a CMO and I'm still almost kind of the co CMO of the company. And that has given me a really nice perspective to where I can see from both lenses, so to speak. Right. So I can see from the sales perspective. I can see from the marketing perspective and I have a very, uh, non bias towards who's right and wrong. I just simply just want to do whatever's going to move us forward, right? So that's really helped me keep those teams in sync, which what it requires is, is obviously getting everybody in the same meeting and having healthy conflict. Like if you read Patrick Lencioni's book, uh, Five Dysfunctions of the Team, one of the things he talks about quite often is, is encouraging and incentivizing healthy conflict, right? In discussion that may to the outside, to somebody who's passive aggressive, pure argumentative, but is really just a discussion that is geared towards moving towards the truth, right? And, and having that as the goal within the calls. So, um, as long as you have somebody on there who is unbiased and can see from both perspectives, who can essentially moderate discussion, you have the right tracking, you have the right communication and beating cadence. From there, I think a lot of that, uh, in syncness will naturally fall in place. Now, one thing to keep in mind, is it is a process, not an event, right? So it's not that we get in sync and then it's finished, right? No, it's like we get in sync and then you have to stay in sync, okay? So it's something we constantly have to work on, right? Like let's say, you know, for instance, one of a, one of my sales managers really moved to like being the CEO of my company. Okay, great. Well, that person who brought up a new sales manager, you know, it's still a process of getting them in sync. Like there's certain biases there, right? Uh, things change over time. There's new, you know, so it, it's something you're always working on like many other things. Yeah, thank you. How did you actually start your company? How did you start your career in sales? Well, I mean, essentially what happened was I was a really, really good, you know, okay, so... I was basically just kind of middle of the road as average as average you can get type of person, right? 3.0 student, didn't really have anything special about me going for me, whatever. Um, and what happened with me is I sucked with girls. So mm -hmm. I started to get in personal development to get better at girls and I got better with girls. Okay. So I was like reading books and stuff, which at the time I was like 50%, like, oh, this is kind of weird. But the other 50% of me was like, okay, like I'm actually like some of the information in these books is good. And I'm like getting better at this. And so then at that point, I really got addicted to the growth mindset because I was like, man, if I can improve this one area of my life, I wonder if I can improve my school, my health, my, all, all these other things. Right. And so what I did is I was like a 3.0 student. I was like almost even get like 2.8s, 2.9s, like just nothing really impressive. I read a few books, did some research online and really created a system in which I was how, how I was going to study. 
that allowed me to essentially start reeling off like 4.0s. And I was doing that, um, you know, just purely off of like work ethic and just had the system I created around it. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, to medical school. I'm going to be a doctor. Like that was my idea of success. Eventually I was reading a book called How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. And that book, you know, it, it, the book wasn't geared towards like, I, I, I don't think this is an outcome a lot of people would have from reading the book, but I read the book and just personally after reading it, I was like, oh man, I want to do this entrepreneurship thing. I don't want to do a doctor, right? And so I knew right then and there, I dropped out of the kind of the medical school sort of application process. I got an interview set up and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm going to stay bartending and start this business. Now I had no idea what I wanted to do, but like my earliest inspirations because I was in health and fitness were like John Romanello and then this other guy who's actually still out there called um, Mike Matthews. He wrote Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. And they were doing some like health and fitness stuff online. I was an applied nutrition degree with like kind of a pre-med focus. So I was, I guess I was a pre-med degree with like a nutrition focus. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing a blog, right? So I started doing this health blogging. Like I was reading, you know, all these people's blogs, uh, you know, Derek Halpern's blog, Amy Porterfield's. St- I was just like, you know, reading all these blogs and I was like super deep into the blogging world. And, you know, so I was blogging and very, very early on, I realized, okay, like, I don't know how to make money doing this. Like I'm blogging. Nobody's going to my website. I have no idea what I want to do. I don't even know if I want to be a health coach. Like, is that really what I want to do? I'm like not even that great a shape. You know, I was drinking a lot at the time. And so it just never felt right. It had massive, massive, massive imposter syndrome. And then what I did is, uh, I took this course from Sam Evans and, uh, you know, I found out about him through Ty Lopez, which is kind of funny. And it's come full circle. I was talking to Ty yesterday, actually. And, I took that course and I just like, I felt like I got a business education from taking the course. And so I was like, wow, like I know so much about this space now. And I what dropped the health it? and, co- sorry. Sorry. What, which course was it? It was consulting accelerator. So this was like, okay. you know, this is like 2016, right? Mm-hmm. And so I learned so much. I was like, okay, I'm going to start a Facebook ads agency. Like that's just what kind of like spoke to me. And that, you know, granted sheet mentality, that's what everybody else was doing back then too. And so did that and took two years and just like had no success. I just sucked terribly. I couldn't generate sales calls. I couldn't close any sales calls. I was just horrible. Okay. Just, just painfully bad. And then what I did after that is I eventually took a coaching program that was more focused on Facebook ads agencies. And that's really when it clicked for me. I went from like zero to like 40, 50 K a month in uh, eight weeks. The problem was I was contracting out all of the work. I had terrible habits. I had no discipline and I basically just blew all the money. And so during that time, I not only quit my job, but I also blew all my money. So I had to move back with my parents. I had no money. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get into this sales thing, this high ticket sales, because I had known I befriended the, the salesperson who had sold me into the program. And I knew he was making like 20, 30 grand a month. And to me, that was like an astronomical amount of money at that time. I was like, dude, if I can just make that, I'm fucking good. So I was like, I'm going to learn this thing. And so I got a job. It was very easy to get a job. And right away, I was making like five to 10K a month with like no stress. So it was like, oh my God, this is 10 times better. And then I started working at it. And I really just went from like, I was really bad when I started. I was probably the worst person on the team. And eventually I just got to the point where uh, I was pretty much like the best or top two people on the team. The first team I was on was really quite good, by the way. And then I left that team, went to another team. And then I was like the, immediately the best person on that team. Then I went to this, the third company I worked at when I was in sales. And, um, I was not only probably the best there. I mean, it was me and another guy were both really good, but probably the best there. But I really started to kind of set some records and, and, you know, even start to put out a little bit of content and build like kind of a reputation for myself in the industry. And then I got to the point where I really did love the company and who I was working for and all this stuff, but I just felt capped and I didn't really know what to do to kind of get to the next level. And so um, I ended up leaving, didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought about partnering with somebody. I was like, maybe I could get back into sales, maybe I got to sell something different. Like I really didn't know what to do, but I ended up starting um, some sales coaching, which turned into sales team consulting, which turned into sales recruiting. And so Meaning that you coached other people. Yeah. So at first I was just coaching people on sales. Right. And then my second iteration was like, okay, well, I think I can make a little bit more money if I'm like coaching sales teams. 
And then my third iteration was when I, okay, when I was coaching these sales teams, I was like, all right, like what they really want is just new sales reps. So it's like, I got to figure out this recruiting thing. And so eventually I kind of, my third iteration of my offer was the recruiting. And, and when I did started doing that, and again, this is a lot of people are doing it now because of me basically. But, um, back when I was doing it, there was only one other guy doing it and he was just getting all the business. And like, I knew I was just as good as that guy. I thought I was a better sales trainer in particular and better teacher. And, uh, I thought I could really, uh, you know, um, come into that business and, and do quite well. And there was just no competition. And so I did. And the response I got overall was quite phenomenal. Uh, just with like some basic, you know, organic. And then I eventually pivoted that into ads. The other key moment along that time, which was summer of 2020, was I just got a few key people on my team that, that really like, there, there's a few pivotal moments, obviously like settling in on the sales recruiting and getting that offer dial was one. Another one was, was getting some of those team members on. And so, uh, that, that really, really, really helped early on just having good people on my team when we were kind of in the startup stage. And then from there it was explosive, you know, like from August of 2020, we were doing 150 K a month. That time next year, we were doing 2 million a month. This is, this is a pretty amazing. How, um, how did you, it, it sounds so effortless. What challenges did you face? in that during that time well a lot like dude I'm, i mean basically almost every challenge you could imagine um the only challenge we never had was sales <laughs> you know because we already had that skill so much experience yeah. as well. and even building the sales team like that was just easy because we i had salesperson and you know me and, and a few of the other key team members that i had at the time we had all built sales teams so that was the easiest part um i think challenge number one was the fulfillment like broke, right? So we had to figure out how to do like done for you, really hands-on fulfillment at scale. The next challenge was, is really getting ads to work and ads to work at good scale, right? And and to do it consistently. Like that's a huge hump that if you can get over, you're gonna have a, a really amazing big business on the other side of that uh, if you do it correctly. So that was a huge uh, thing. And I mean, that t you know, um, a lot of people just complain about ads and oh, it doesn't work and blah, 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 blah. But I mean, like, I just, I, I don't think people realize like, man, like when I figured it out, I, I knew I could figure it out. Like I knew it was possible. And uh, a lot of that was because I had worked for a company that was mainly generated uh, all their income from running on ads. And I just, you know, t spent a fuckload of money in testing, buying data essentially, and just iterating version after version after version after version to try to get something to work. And then finally I got some stuff to work and then you get better at it over time. It's a skill like anything else. So that was probably the next challenge after fixing the fulfillment because really the fulfillment challenges came first because organic was so strong and we were getting crazy word of mouth referrals. Uh, the next challenge, you know, product has always been something and improving the product and getting the product better. I mean, that's always been a challenge. I would say the next challenges after that was, you know, me becoming a good manager, right? Which, yeah. You know, to be quite candid, I don't even know if I really at that time became one. I think I've gotten better uh, later in my career, um, but it was me becoming a good manager. The next challenge after that was my managers becoming good managers and then eventually them training up managers. So there is like, I mean, I, I will say like there is a, okay. So when the entrepreneur or whoever's the main person has to learn management and how to lead and manage teams and build teams and like go from like creator in a lot of, in a lot of times in this industry to manager, that's like a big gap, you know, but on the other side of that gap is a big boost in revenue. Then the next gap is like having that person build and build up and develop managers under them and leaders under them. And the next gap is having those managers, like, 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 like if that's you, then below you is like the managers and they're, they're building up their team. The next gap is them, them building up leaders under them. So really getting two levels of management from you to the front lines. And almost every time, uh, you have to add another layer of, of middle management. It is not only infinitely harder, but, um, substantially harder, but also, uh, 
you have it, it just it's it's much harder. You have to really, 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 really be able to still like keep the teams performing at the same level in which they were because you're going to be outlaying more money to middle management. And on top of that, uh, you're getting raising CPM. So it's like much more harder to stay profitable. But if you can do it, usually there's a big side of growth on the other side, right? And so uh, that's something to consider as well. So every single one of those was a challenge. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's been a bunch of stuff, right? Like you have HR challenges, you have client success challenges, you have PR challenges, you have ads challenges every step along the way. You have, um, you know, everything, right? Like there's just every day there's challenges. Oh, yeah. Especially um, when you have to be when you have to go from creator to manager that's like something most people cannot pull off because it's like you're a different personality type usually yeah being a creator being a creative person that i don't know wants to become famous or or something and then you, all of a sudden you have to deal with people that's that's quite new how did you learn to manage how to manage people well i mean there's a lot of good books about management um, unfortunately I didn't read any of them until after I probably learned how to do it. Um, you know, I think I just learned by necessity. It was like, mm. I just got to figure it out. I would say, um, a better response actually, and more true response is really where I learned a lot of my good baseline business skills is when I was a key player and top salesperson of traffic and funnels. And I was able to be there while we went from like 300 grand a month to a million five a month. Because, and, 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 you know, part of that time too, I was in an office. So I was able to see kind of how the company ran, what the meetings were like, how marketing meeting was, how this meeting was, how that meeting was. I was like, oh, here's who's in the finance department. So I was able to see what like a real big company looked like, or at least a, you know, 15 million, 18 million dollar year, or uh, 18 million a year company. And I was also from being managed and also helping kind of manage some other people and being a team lead. I was able to really like see, okay, great. Like this is how, you know, uh, teams are built and how you manage teams. Now was everything at the time and everything that they did perfect and best practice. No, of course not. No company ever is hmm. right. So I kind of took some things I liked about that. And then I felt like I improved upon it and also took some things I didn't like and inverted it and did the opposite. And that's really where it came up to my management style. So I sort of had that as a base case. And then after that, it's like, you kind of sort of, uh, add like aspects to it as you go, you know, it's like you, you, you start learning and, uh, figuring stuff out and, um, listening to people, you know, and, and you just sort of develop and get better and better and better. Yeah. It's very powerful to be in a position in which you just have to succeed and uh, where it would be just very painful not to. That helps a lot having that pressure. Mm. In, I've heard you say that there are seven key steps in every successful sale. Can you elaborate on that? What are they? We'll do. We got five minutes, so I'll, I'll do this and then we'll probably wrap it up. But there's yeah. pain, doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust. So think about it this way. There's really three steps of every sales process, okay? The first step is you're really finding out what they're problem is. Now there's two types of problems. There's pain and then there's unfulfilled desire. Pain is like, think about, let's say, uh, using stem cells, right? You might use stem cells to alleviate pain, like an actual joint pain, or you might use them for like longevity purposes and just like long-term healing, which is more of, you know, you're moving towards something, which is an unfulfilled desire. So there's two types of problems. You're either moving away or moving towards. If you're moving away, we call it a pain. If you're moving towards, we call it unfulfilled desire. So the first stage is identifying the gap and which type of gap is it, or, if, or you know, it could be a combination in some ways. So you really want to figure out in, in the discovery, like, why are they here and what is that gap, right, amongst some other things. Then the second stage is you're really crafting a thesis, okay? So a thesis, and we talked about this earlier, but it's really what you would do if you were them to get them from point A to point B. Like what is your idea and your way of thinking about how they should get from point A to point B and what you would really do if, if you were them in their situation. Now, hopefully that aligns with buying your product, but sometimes it doesn't and that's fine. Like you got to let that person, you know, maybe refer them to somebody else. 
but I always would leave somebody with a thesis of what I think they should do to get to their goal, you know? And if you're a salesperson, like you should be an expert enough in your field and about the problem that you're talking to people about to always be able to make a recommendation regardless if it's something you can help with or not. So, right, we develop that thesis. The third stage is getting them to accept the thesis. So that's, you know, your your pitch, your close, and your objection handling, and so on and so forth. So again, the thesis is just a way of thinking about solving the problem, the pain, the unfulfilled desire, et cetera, right? It's the same way Russell Brunson, you know, if he speaks on stage, he doesn't try to sell you on click funnels. He tries to sell you on the idea that funnels are the newest, best, greatest way to generate customers online. And if you believe that belief, by the nature of doing so, you're naturally going to use click funnels, right? Because that thesis always... All, let the that thesis it makes sense, but the only reason you can't do it is the things click funnel stalls, right? So if you watch his presentations like a tennis growth con, etc., that's what he's mainly trying to sell you on is that idea, right? And so it's the very same thing. Every sale has that. Sometimes the thesis can incorporate some of the product. That's fine. Uh, sometimes it's completely independent of the product. Okay. So those are the basic three stages. Now in the discovery, what you're really trying to knock down is the seven beliefs okay so the first one's pain we talked about that right pro or up uh, as a you know pain or unfulfilled desire the second one's doubt which means they have to believe that they can't fix that on their own right or they would take unnecessary resources or unnecessary time and they're much more better off getting a service or a done for you or you know using a proven pathway etc right the third one is cost, which means the cost of leaving the problem, pain, unfulfilled desire unchanged over time is greater than the cost and time, energy, money, attention, reputation, etc., of investing into your program, right? The desire is the compelling payoff to fix the problem, right? So you can't just have somebody moving away from something. They need to be oriented towards something. There's even studies where, you know, Cialdini will, um, he's, his team's conducted studies in the sense where They've uh, tested two different marketing messages. One just was completely pain oriented. The other one was pain oriented, but then, um, uh, you know, also in the copy was basically uh, oriented them towards something to desire and, and a solution to do next. And the response was like, you know, I think like one got like no response. And then the other one had a tremendous amount of response because people find, you know, and he hypothesized when essentially people are completely pain oriented and they're moving away from something, but they have nothing to move towards. It does create analysis by paralysis and they just freeze, right? So there's desire. Um, so pain, doubt, cost, desire, money is the resources and willingness to fix the problem. Okay. And then support means people are around them, close to them or other stakeholders into the decision in one, in one way, shape or form, support them in fixing the problem. Okay. And then trust is finally trust in your method or your thesis of fixing the problem. Right. So really those are the seven things you want to execute within the discovery. And obviously it ends on trust, which is where we're craft, uh, crafting our thesis and being able to present that. And then we got to get them to accept it. Great. Thank you. As a last question, if someone wants to learn more about you or reach you or use your service, how can they reach you the best? Yeah, just go to closers.io. It's been a pleasure. Yep, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.